The weirdness behind Chicago is over. That's what I'm talking about! But just when you thought things were going back to normal at NASCAR, in comes something tricky. There you go, another another driver just losing it. They're not out of the woods yet. Oh, baby! Oh! Instead, they're caught in a triangle in the Poconos. Oh! Hard into the wall, he goes around! Stop the madness! Just start another around the track. Well, if you thought you can get lost in the Bermuda Triangle, you have no idea how fast you can lose a car to the track up in Pocono. Welcome to another edition of Around the Track. I'm Gabe McDonald. Carla Gebhardt will be along shortly, and she won't be alone. America's crew chief, Larry McReynolds, is in the house as well. Plus, we take a deep dive into Garage Confidential with the man who recently locked up his playoff spot, Team Penske's Austin Cindric. But first things first, we got to talk about the tricky triangle coming up this weekend in Pocono. Pocono Raceway. For drivers, it's loved by some, revered by others, but for fans, it's near the top of the list for racing. Not a lot of banking here though, which is ironic because of the elevation in the mountains, but there are plenty of bumps that drivers have to navigate through to find a groove and the proper line to gain maximum speed. And watch out for turn one though, lots of drama in the past in that sweeping bend. And of course, we have very long straightaways, the longest in NASCAR, I might add, which means plenty of opportunities to pass if and only if you can get through the gears. But don't just take it from me though, here's from the drivers. It's just been a track that has suited me. Um, and certainly since being with Gabehart, I feel like we could or should have won every race we've ever run there. Um, I love Pocono. I, you know, since going to that one date, the fans turn out in huge numbers and uh, the atmosphere there is fantastic. Uh, the racing, we've seen it, it's such exciting restarts there. And then we see usually a strategy race type of play out towards the end, which we really enjoy that challenge. So Pocono has not been a great track. The Indy Oval has not been a great track. So I'm, I'm personally looking forward to it just because um, early on, Pocono was good and, and has kind of trailed off, I feel, in the last four or five years. We're going to need all the downforce, all the horsepower we can bring, and um, the fans always turn out in huge bunches there, so uh, it's, it's always really fun to see all that. And here's Pocono by the numbers. We'll go 400 miles over 160 laps on this two and a half mile asphalt trial. What turn for? That's the saying that the locals like to say up there. This will be the 91st time the Cup Series has hosted a weekend in the mountains of Pennsylvania. And of course, we have nine past winners in the field this weekend, but none has, won has more wins here than Denny Hamlin, who has seven victories in the Poconos in that number 11 car. We're going to keep it 100, though. That's what the kids like to say, because Sunday will be Austin Cindric's 100th Cup Series start. We'll talk with him a little bit later in Garage Confidential. And you got to qualify well here at Pocono. The cars who start up front have the advantage the whole race. 41% of cars who start in the first three rows have gone on to take the checkered flag. Now let's bring in Carla Gebhardt, who has America's crew chief standing by. All right, we have America's crew chief joining us now, Larry McReynolds. Once again, we got to talk about the tricky triangle of Pocono this week. And why is it called the tricky triangle to begin with, Larry? Well, pretty much every oval we go to, you have two ends of the racetrack. You have turns one and two, you have turns three and four, and then you have two straightaways. But Pocono is called a triangle for a reason. It has three distinct corners and all three corners are very different and it has three straightaways. So every corner is a little bit different, every straightaway, even though all three of them are very long. I mean, the front stretch is 3,740 feet long. It's the widest and one of the longest straightaways in the whole NASCAR schedule. And uh, it's trick. it's called tricky for a reason because it's tricky to get all three of those corners down pat. So how do you approach it? How do you attack a track like this as a driver? Well, honestly, my days as a crew chief, we focused on turn three. And the reason we focused on turn three, it's only six degrees of banking. It's very, very flat and it goes forever. And how you could get off turn three, that dictated that speed all the way down that long 3,700 foot front straightaway that I talked about. If you didn't get off turn three, it would kill your speed all the way down that straightaway. But honestly, Carla, with the Gen 7 car, the way the competition is, I won't say you find a compromise with, three, but with the three different corners, but I can almost promise you, whatever driver goes to victory lane, he's going to talk about how good his car drove in all three turns. And that's a challenge because, as I said, all three of them are different. So I was talking to a lot of drivers in Chicago just last week about Pocono, and a lot of them don't feel very confident going into this track. But one guy that does 
is Denny Hamlin. Why is he get so good here? Well, it's not my opinion. I actually <laughs> spoke to his crew chief, Chris Gabehart, a little bit earlier this week about that very thing, and he said Denny does a really nice job at dissecting the turns of a racetrack. And I've already mentioned three di distinct different turns, and he said Denny really focuses on all three turns, the exit. Why? Because of what I said, trying to get good speed down those long straightaways because even the short shoot between turns two, the tone turn and turns three, that straightaway is very, very long. But Denny Hamlin rolled in there as a rookie. A rookie normally does not prevail at Pocono, but he rolled in there as a rookie. 18 years ago in 2006, not only did he sit on the pole for both races, he swept the races that year, unheard of for a rookie. I'm not even sure prior to 2006, Denny had even been to the state of Pennsylvania, <laughs> but he rolled in there and he embraced that three-turn racetrack. We've been talking about the turns, the straightaways. Let's talk about pit strategy now because this is different also than a normal oval. So what are the windows here for, for these crew chiefs to figure out? Yeah, it's 160 laps and 400 miles. For years, we actually ran 200 laps and 500 miles there. This is much better running a 400 mile race there. The fuel window is about 40 laps. It's almost like two laps per gallon. The stages are 30, a very short first stage, but then 65 and 65. And the strategy, Carla, honestly kind of dictates where you're running and how you're running. I think we'll see three different strategies. I think you will see the first stage kind of takes care of itself because you can run that without stopping, but you have to stop in stage two and stage three. I think you will see teams what we call flipping the stages. In other words, pitting before the end of stage one and end of stage two before they close pit road and leapfrogging the competition on track position, staying out at the stage end. I think you will see teams take that stage two and stage three and just split it in half. Try to take advantage of those four fresh Goodyear tires and two runs in each stage, but then there'll be the teams, maybe it's the teams that's not running that great, that just run it as far as they can. Go to the need fuel. But another thing, remember, we only have six races to go in the regular season. We got quite the battle for the regular season points lead. You've got Chase Elliott, you've got Kyle Larson, you've got Tyler Reddick, Denny Hamlin. It's hard to give up stage points, and that becomes a fine line between flipping those stages and giving up stage points or running to the end of the stage and trying to get some of those points. We've also got some drivers that are going to be going to Pocono with less money in their pockets. Bubba Wallace currently after his post-race incident with Alex Bowman in the win and the cool-down lap. What did you think about this $50,000 he's going to have to pay, but no points taken away, and that's different than Carson Hosevar and Harrison Burton from two weeks ago. Yeah, the minute this penalty came out, Carla, I reached out to Elton Sawyer and NASCAR because I always want to hear their side. And he explained the difference, and, and I totally understand the difference. You know, the Carson Hosevar, Harrison Burton situation on the backstretch at Nashville was under caution. And that probably took points away from Harrison Burton because of that accident. The situation with Bubba Wallace and Alex Bowman at Chicago was post-race. I understand it. I don't know that I agree with it because to me, on a cool down lap, that's more dangerous than under a caution because under caution, a driver is still buckled in a racing environment. I saw the video, Alex Bowman's window net was already down. I don't know, he may have already been unbuckled, getting ready to celebrate. Even Bubba Wallace's window net was already down. But to me, I, I understand the difference, but to me, it was more dangerous what happened post-race Chicago than under caution at Nashville. You wanna give us your pick for Pocono real quick? Well, obviously, it, you, how do you bet against anybody from Joe Gibbs Racing or Hendrick Motorsports. Uh, I think in the last dozen races or so, give or take, they've won all but one of them. And Ford has only one win in those 11 races, and that was Kevin Harvick a few years ago in that four car. Team Penske, I'm going to be watching them closely. Team Penske has won nine times at Pocono, but the last time was 12 years ago, Brad Keselowski back in 2012. But let me tell you something I've got my eye on outside of Hendrick Motorsports and Joe Gibbs Racing. A guy that has quietly moved to third in the regular season points, Tyler Reddick in that 45 car at 23-11. The two races we've run at Pocono in the Gen 7 car, he has finished second both times. They've got speed every week. He's tied for 
for the most top fives in 2024 with Kyle Larson. He has more top tens than any other driver. They are bringing speed every single week. This is where he maybe can get that second win of 2024. You mentioned finishing second at Pocono. He's done that a lot also this season. Just last week in Chicago, we talked to him about that. He was uh, not too happy, but hopefully he can kind of get out of that slump and get back to victory lane. Larry, we what a great it. problem to have, I finishing know. second. I know. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Larry Mack, certainly a smart man. Well, here's one big blockbuster from this week. Future NASCAR Hall of Fame crew chief Rodney Childers is moving to Spire Motorsports next season to take over the seven team of Corey LaJoy. Childers is the active wins leader for crew chief in NASCAR and will take over for Ryan Sparks, who will focus solely on being the competition director for Spire. Childers led Kevin Harvick to the 2014 Cup Series Championship in five straight Final Four appearances. Childers will now focus on helping Corey LaJoy win his first Cup Series race. Talking about trajectory for the season, it's that's first box check. Let's make the playoffs. Austin Zender's win at Gateway was big. Up next, we're taking a look back on that playoff clinching win and what he needs to do to do it again at Pocono. In silly season, AKA free agency is already at a fever pitch. One Cup Series driver has a new ride, while another Xfinity driver is on the chopping block. All the major moves are coming up. And who doesn't love the sound of the engine roaring down the straightaway? I know I do, but pretty soon that engine roar could be replaced with a swoosh. Confused? We were too at first, but NASCAR's latest technology is on the way right here on Around the Track. Back on Around the Track, another one of the SHR4 finds a new ride. Noah Gregson has signed a multi-year deal with Front Row Motorsports. 25-year-old now stays in the Ford Performance Camp after Stuart Haas announced that it's going down to a one-car factory team at the end of this season. FRM bought one of SHR's charters, which will bring them to a three-car team coming up in 2025. For Noah, he says walking into the shop was a huge eye-opener. Meanwhile, for Front Row, they get an experienced driver with a ton of upside. And the thing that stuck out in my mind, most importantly, is, is what Jerry said when we met was, you know, Bob's goal is to, to grow each and every year. And through the experiences that I've had in the last several years, it's, it's been, you know, fun to challenge myself. And, and there's challenges and adversity along the way. But, but during that building process, I really enjoy that, that time to step up as a leader and, and help grow the organization. I'm just super excited. Noah's a guy that's uh, he's been successful in every level of racing he, he's ever been in and we've just watched him grow over the last couple of years in the Cup Series and we really just believe he's just starting to scratch the potential of what he can do. Of course earlier this season Michael McDowell announced that he was leaving Front Row Motorsports for Spire Motorsports which opens up his number 34. Ty Gilliland will remain in the number 38. That means another driver still needs to be announced for Front Row. No word on what number Noah will take or who will be his crew chief at FRM. Well from in to out, Haley Deegan no longer has a ride in the Xfinity Series. AM Racing and the 22 year old driver have parted ways with Deegan saying the two sides goals no longer align. Shortly before the announcement, AM replaced Deegan with Joey Logano in the Chicago Xfinity Street Race and tabbed Josh Berry to take her number 15 ride this weekend in Pocono. Deegan has struggled since being in Xfinity. She's currently in 28th place in 2024. Well, this year has seen a number of drivers snap some long winless streaks. Of them, Team Penske's Austin Sendrick. It took 85 races from when he won his Cup Series debut at the Daytona 500 to get back to victory lane. Now locked into the playoffs, he's got new goals for the rest of the year. Carla sat down with him in this week's Garage Confidential. All right, Austin, we got to talk about Team Penske. we got to talk about your season. But what a five-week stretch for the NASCAR Cup Series and Team Penske right now. I know they've had a lot more success even outside of NASCAR, but what are your overall thoughts about just the performance of Penske right now? Yeah, no, it's it's obviously been great to, to get locked in the playoffs, not just with me on the two-car, but but all three of our cars, and, and, and um, to be the first team to also be able to do that. And I think it gives our team a pretty clear focus on you know what what our goals are for the next couple of months, um, really across the board, or next couple of weeks, I should say, before the before the playoffs. So it's going to sneak up on us fast. But uh, yeah, it, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, we we got to keep the the streak alive. I think we're an eight eight straight week winning streak with. Um, with all of our programs across IMSA and IndyCar and NASCAR, so uh, we were the only we were the only series on track this weekend. So we, <laughs> we knew we had to keep the dream alive there. How much of a goal was that for Team Penske to get all three drivers locked into the playoffs? I mean, it's a goal every year. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a team, it's an organization. I feel like we have drivers that are all plenty capable enough 
I mean, I have two champions as teammates, let's be honest. So um, <laughs> the expectations for, for all of us to be in the playoffs and have a shot at a championship. And you were the first driver to get locked in going Someone back to, to Gateway. I know that was a, an awesome race for you. How much did that win kind of change the trajectory of your season and kind of how you approach these these races in the summer months ahead of the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, talk about trajectory for the season. I mean, it's that's first box checked is make the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, that was that was one probably my only goal going into the season. However, what whichever way it happens, like making the playoffs is such a big deal because it, it does it gives you a shot at a championship. And um, you know, for us, whether if it's going out and trying to find playoff points, but I think it really comes down to you know Gateway. Yes, we won the race. Um, yes, the ending was crazy, but. It was by far the best race, like from an execution standpoint, running you know inside the top three the entire race, um, and, and we need to be able to perform at that high level um, on a week-to-week -week basis to, to expect to, to go somewhere in the playoffs. And, and I think for us that was proof of concept that we're plenty capable of that. Not that I had any lack of confidence that, that was possible, um, and obviously I'm, I'm in an environment that that's very much the expectation. So. Uh, for, for me, uh, it's just about you know the next couple of weeks leading up to these playoffs. How do I, how do we as a team get to where we're we're on that level a little bit more consistently and, and, and a little more used to it? All right, we got Pocono coming up, and obviously this is a very unique track. A lot of drivers are really good at this track, but what makes it unique from your perspective when you're preparing for this race? Well, it's the only triangle, so yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that's that's the first thing that stands out. Um, but it's got three extremely unique corners, and it, it's it's a place that. You, you're never really satisfied with your race car, but you, you, because the corners are so different, because you have you know the, the flat turn three that leads on the long front straightaway, the restarts are absolutely crazy because the front straightaway is so wide. Um, but then the tunnel turn and the bumps in there, how do you get your car to work through that with the ride height? And then turn one is, is, is obviously um, you know a bit more of a braking corner. Uh, so it's, it's kind of just a little bit of everything all across the board. I've always loved going to Pocono uh, just because of those challenges, because you never are really exactly happy with the car. You kind of just have to, to deal with your problems and pick which one's the, the most important. Huge thanks to Austin and Team Penske for the time this week. Well, Alex Bowman is winning on and off the track this week. Why? Well, he's got a new teammate that has four paws and a ton of cash. It's not as weird as it sounds. That story's on deck here on ATT. And the next gen car just got here, but are we about to see another new ride hit the tracks? This whip isn't just any gas guzzler, it actually doesn't take any gas at all. Details on NASCAR's EV prototype when around the track continues. Well, I've always said we need more dogs in the show. Well, we got them. That's because Alex Bowman is running this Best Friends themed Ally Chevy Camaro up in Pocono. Best Friends is a passion project for the Chicago Street Race winner. Along with Ally, Bowman donates $4,800 to a local animal shelter in the city where they race, all in hopes of finding forever homes for animals across the country. And he certainly walks the walk for this cause. Bowman actually just rescued another animal through Best Friends. I just yeah. rescued um, uh, another puppy, so um, yeah, it's been super cool. I have a terrorist in my home at the moment, but um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's like 10% dog and 90% shark, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been fun. Well, NASCAR is always trying to push the envelope when it comes to progressing the sport. With that comes a new era, an electric stock car that made its debut on the streets of Chicago. Check this out, NASCAR and ABB debuting an EV prototype. The sport is all about gasoline and high octane, but it also wants to deduct its carbon footprint, which is why NASCAR R&D came out with this six-phase, three-motor, 1,000-kilowatt motorsport beast. Now, the prototype isn't for intermediate or super speedways, but there's a possibility you see you could see a car like this in the future at a short track or a road course. For NASCAR, this is all part of the evolution of racing. Senses are uh, confused after uh, getting into a, a full electric car that has the performance that it does. You're still going to see the car jacked up. You're still going to see the tires taken off, tires taken on, still the quickness right there. The only difference is, as opposed to putting fuel in, the batteries will already, ha already have all the fuel they need to get them back on the track quickly. Well, still to come, Shane Van Gisbergen had a pretty sick burnout after taking last week's Xfinity race. Alex Bowman decided he was going to make a cloud that could be seen from across Lake Michigan. Who's going to burn it down in Long Pond? Sportsbook odds and a victory lane lock coming up next on ATT.
All right, next week we're hitting the bricks in Indy and we're going back to the Oval at the Brickyard. So we're bringing in Justin Haley to talk all things Indianapolis in next week's Garage Confidential. That's next week right here on Around the Track. Be sure to check your local Next Star station for when ATT airs in your city coming up next week. Well, it's called the Tricky Triangle, but Vegas thinks these five drivers can figure out whatever trick Pocono throws their way this weekend. Here's a race odds courtesy of DraftKings. Denny Hamlin is, of course, the top spot with four to one odds. He has seven wins at Pocono, so no surprise there. Kyle Larson is next at nine to two. Then you have Christopher Bell with 13 to two odds. Round got the top five are Martin Truex Jr. and Tyler Reddick, who both have 15 to two odds to get it done at the Tricky Triangle. Well, the victory lane locks, it's time for that. And for the record, Carla Gabbard is going with the low hanging fruit here. That's the 11 of Denny Hamlin. Myself, I like dark horses, and my dark horse is by no means a long shot. Enter Tyler Reddick. Of course, I mentioned how smart Larry Mack was at the beginning of the show, because I'm going with the 45 as well. The 45, he's been on the brink of getting into victory lane in back to back weeks. The same can be said at Pocono specifically, as Reddick has come in second in each of the last two races at the Tricky Triangle. He already has one win this year, and is only 23 points behind Carl Larson for the points lead. So I like Reddick to make his way towards the top and get another checkered flag this year. For one more race until the Olympic break, we'll see you back here to preview the Brick Art for. 100. For Garlic Ebhart, I'm Gabe McDonald. Enjoy the race of Pocono. Thank <laughs> you.